Hello everybody, it's Mike Yao with Savage Kingdom's role-playing game and Fire in the Head Productions. Thought it was time to do another video. It's been quite a while. It's been a, I don't know, it's been a week or so, but uh, it's been a few weeks since I've done a how-to, uh, another how-to video in the game, um, the game system that is Savage Kingdom's third edition. Savage Kingdom in general, but right now we're on SK3 at third edition. Uh, it is different enough that I'll focus more really just on that game system. Um, so the last few videos, was, I think I did a how to, uh, to apply and use health and stamina in the game and there's, uh, actions in combat. I think there was one other, which I can't recall, but this one doesn't matter. This one is actually about defense and armor, about the various, uh, defense and armor since those go together. This video shouldn't take too long. Famous last words. Um, so again, we're in this core rule book. There's the Savage East as well supplement, but this is really has all the core rules in it. Um, a few optional rules were added in the Savage East and that kind of thing. So, um, but really, hence why it's called the core rule book. It has all the core rules in it, as well as the uh, stuff about the West, Western continent, the Gazetteer, and all the lore. Um, mentions a little bit some of the, the other places of the known world, but it focuses, as you might know, on Astagonia, which is the Western kind of European-esque continent. All right, so on page 274, I'm going to start there. This is Actions in Combat, which, you know, I've been in this chapter before on some videos. That's a pretty long, uh, fairly long chapter. It's, uh, it combines actions and combat as all kind of one chapter because the, usually the two go hand in hand, not always necessarily. You can have action scenes, which I highly suggest in your SK, in whatever tabletop role-playing games. Um, chase scenes are really cool, so... Um, not every not every action has to necessarily end up in violence, but often it does, probably 80, 90% of the time, I would think. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, in, sorry about that. That was random. So, in Savage Kingdoms, there is, uh, you have two forms of defense. You have uh, dodge and parry. So, dodge is figured, uh, it's 10 plus your total acrobatics skill modifier, meaning your agility plus your skill levels. And if you have any miscellaneous or other bonuses on the character sheet that you might get through the talents or through racial traits or something like that. So that full number, for example, say you have uh, an agility of plus one and you have two skill levels in acrobatics, that would be your dodge defense would be 13. And maybe you have a talent that gives you plus one to acrobatics, uh, such as limber, the limber talent or something. So that's a 14. So you'd have a 14 dodge defense, which isn't horrible, uh, especially for like a beginning character for the advancement zero or even advancement one character. Um, not bad. So the other uh, defense is parry. So parry is 10 plus your total melee weaponry skill modifier, meaning your physique plus your skill level and skill levels, if any, in uh, melee weaponry or weaponry colon melee as it's listed on the character sheet. Um, and then any other bonuses that might apply, such as like the mercenary talent. There's a couple others as well. So say, for example, uh, you have a, let's say a physique of plus two. You're, you know, you're either a decent guy, person size, or you're a normal person that's pretty muscular. That's a physique of plus two. Uh, and you only, you have one skill level in melee weaponry and you have a plus one other bonus. So again, we come with a 14, um, in this case. So. Let's do a different example. Uh, <laughs> you have a physique of only plus zero, or which is average, and you say as if you're an advanced character and you're you're more of a warrior type, you've been putting a lot of points into it. You have five skill levels in melee weaponry and uh, two point two uh, other bonus points from various talents and or, or racial stuff or, or maybe stuff you've earned in play. So that's a total of 17, right? So 10 plus uh, plus zero physique, uh, five skill levels, uh, plus the two other bonus of 17. And on the character sheet, and those of you who played the game, you, 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 this is all simple stuff, I'm sure. Uh, it's all calculated, like it's easy to calculate. It's super simple. So in, the, in that case, you're going to have a 17, which is uh, pretty respectable. Um, you know, that's... Um, a, a zero advancement character could start with a 17. I've seen it a few times, but you really have to stack in that uh, in that direction. Usually, it's kind of warrior type characters. Um, you could play a non non berserker, non soldier, whatever, and, and 
end up with almost that, but you'd have to really kind of focus on melee weaponry. So the um, that's the beauty of, of the system, the Savage Kingdom system. Um, can be a little complicated sometimes, but uh, the the payoff is that it's very robust. That's the term I always hear described about it with reviewers or or just casual people talking about it. Uh, that you can do a lot with it, and that was that was kind of my intent. And and yes, it it, it made it game design even harder because I have to uh, design a lot more things that cross reference and stuff like that. Um, because I'm not building a simple class system, although there are callings. Uh, but class systems are a little easier to design, at least for me. I, I think they're actually pretty easy. So you're just designing blocks and packages of things. Um, but, you know, the core system itself when you're designing a game is, is really kind of the hard part. But if you take the sort of the class package system, to me it's a little bit easier. Whereas um, this is more of a hybrid system, a skill-based system, but also a little mix of classes with the callings. And that was kind of my intent. I kind of wanted to, I got a little tired of the debate about class uh, class-based uh, tabletop RPGs and skill base, and I'm like, well, there's there's different categories, people. I mean, you can let's just why don't we just go in the middle um, and and show that that's a possibility. All right, so how do those apply? So dodge is um, dodge can be used in almost all circumstances. Uh, you can almost always dodge. So you can um, and you can dodge missiles. So range attacks uh, go against your dodge defense. And you can also use dodge against melee weaponry. And third edition, by the way, just kind of a cool little note, maybe design note. I almost just to streamline the system. I almost uh, I was looking at doing uh, dodge defense was just against ranged attacks only. Uh, and I even looked at maybe calling it ranged attack defense, but that just got weird, as you can see probably. Uh, and then parry was just going to be for melee. Uh, cause those, anybody that's done some martial arts or medieval reenactment, that kind of thing, you, uh, 90, 90% of the time you're dodge, you're parrying when you're in, in combat. So you see a lot of movies or where people are ducking and tumbling and doing this flashy stuff. That's very rare. Um, I mean, I, I've fought some people that are like, and I'm actually relatively fast myself, even, even as I get a little bit older, I'm still... Fortunately, somewhat dexterous, <laughs> although I'm slowing down for sure. Uh, but, you know, some younger kind of wiry guys that were really good at kind of dodging. But, but even then, it just, it, it was pretty rare. Uh, and if you're in a heavy armor sort of melee battle, the dodgy stuff doesn't really work a whole lot. But I will say this, uh, anybody that's done any martial arts or any kind of, you know, anything about combat or fighting theory, you know that you always want to take a glancing blow. If you're going to get hit at all, you want to take the most glancing blow as possible, which is why you should always be moving. Or if you're not moving, you're getting ready to move. Meaning that you're, you, so you want to take glancing blows. You want to, the, your, your armor is only as effective as you're taking glancing blows. There's no armor in the world. Uh, the best plate armor that was ever made cannot stand up to uh, a big guy with a massive great axe that just hits you straight, straight on, or even even a great sword, but, or even worse, like a mace or a flail or a, a military pick or something like that. So it's literally designed to go through that type of armor. Uh, so point being, um, dodging in melee is uh, it's possible in the game system, but you know, in reality, it's pretty rare. But Savage Kingdoms, like a lot of tabletop role-playing games, is based a little bit in reality. Obviously, we have some reality, just grounded fantasy. Um, I've made this point before. If if, if uh, some people, some some of the fantasists are always like, "Well, it's just fantasy, and it's none of it's it's just all fantasy. It's none of it's real. Don't even worry about it." But yet, it is grounded in, because we're using long swords and spears and helmets, and not using uh, kushimabobs or squawkle doodles. The point being, they're, they're actual historical weapons that we're referring to, and armor and clothing items and uh, the monarchy system in most realms, all of that is real, was real history. So that's where the reality comes from. So a little argument against all those fantasists that are always saying that all the time. But anyway, I mean, I get their point overall, but it's like, no. Um, but the fantasy aspect is the, is you know, there's the layer of the grounded reality part, and we're adding magic and dragons and and maybe or, or a little twit you know we build cultures that are maybe kind of medieval medieval-esque or even antic uh, uh, ancient world-esque and we just we tweak them that's what i do anyway and tweak them enough to where they're your own thing and your own world so but the layer and the grounding is always there so point being <laughs> uh the defense system is based like 
most of the rule system is based on some kind of reality of, of from history and, and even modern worlds and, so, and the modern world in some way. All right, so going back to what I was talking about. So dodge you can use at all times, whether it's against a range attack or whether it's against a um, melee attack. So the only thing, and I think it, I'm not sure if I put it in the book. I th think I did. Uh, but if I didn't, I, this is what the video is for. I'll t I'm telling you now. So there might, it's up to the GM. So if, say if your character's trapped in the corner, and uh, like in a corner of a, a chamber, a room or something, and surrounded by attackers, you could rule that you can't really use dodge defense there. There's really no way to dodge to. Now, granted, dodging isn't necessarily jumping from square to square or yard to yard on a grid. It's, it's mostly, it's ducking and dodging, and you're mostly in the same space. But still, it makes, you know, it makes a good point. Um, or you can use, sure, you can use your dodge defense, but it's at minus two in this case, or, or maybe even minus five or something like that, whatever the GM feels. Remember the old SK um, sort of analog is minus twos and minus fives. It's kind of, a, those are there for a reason. You see plus ones, you see plus fours, but... In general, plus two and plus five, it would be is what's equated to to like advantage in um, D and D five by me. So, um, yeah. So just keep that in mind. So otherwise, dodge defense you can use pretty much at all times, other than, other than being asleep or off guard, obvious reasons. Speaking of which, uh, your off guard defense. All the stuff is in the book, of course, but hence the video. Just wanted to kind of go over it. Uh, if you're caught off guard, your defense is ten. Um, unless you have cat-like reflexes or some other, or some kind of sorcery, some kind of magic going on that, uh, that negates that. But generally, the only way you can kind of negate that, uh, to boost that higher is to have cat-like reflexes. Meaning that when something's about to happen, there's always that last moment you wake up. Not wake up. Uh, you, you, you snap too. You're not off guard. So if you're asleep, it actually doesn't work at all. So, um, or incapacitated in some other way or helpless, uh, restrained, that sort of thing. Um, also, um, let's see, what else would dodge defense? I have, that's probably it. Okay, so speaking of ranged attacks, so uh, this has come up a few times. I think it's pretty clear in the book, but a couple, couple of you have brought it up. Um, you can't parry missiles unless you have it. There's a talent called parry missiles. Uh, so in other words, you can't use your parry defense against uh, arrows or a javelin or a hand axe. Arrows is kind of obvious. Javelin is kind of obvious. Hand axe, I mean, I, I've knocked a dagger out of the air once or a hand axe, but it's it's clunky and it's not that likely. I doubt I could do it two or three times in a row. Um, and this is medieval rag. This wasn't even a real, a, well, it was, a, it was a kind of a real axe, but it wasn't like sharp or whatever. It, it, it would have hurt, but yeah, <laughs> I had armor and stuff on. Anyway, so point is, uh, that's really hard to do. So it takes a, an actual talent to do that, uh, meaning that you train to do that all the time. So just keep in mind, you can't use uh, parry defense against ranged attacks unless you have the parry missiles talent. Uh, all right, speaking of continuing on parry defense, um, or defense parry, or parry defense, um, you have to have a shield or weapon in your hand in order to use it, unless you have, I think it's seven or more skill levels in brawling, uh, and then you can use it at a minus two penalty. So a little complicated there, a little complex, but not, not too bad. Uh, meaning that, so if somebody's really good with their hands, brawling, martial artists, that kind of that person, those, those people are pretty good at parrying, but in my head, and I, and I think re reality supports this, uh, they still would not be quite the parrier that someone with a big a shield and a axe or a sword or a spear or a pole arm or something might have. Uh, that's just much easier to parry with. Some weapons, being weapons, actually are made to as to be even more defensive. They're made to parry almost. Uh, axes are great to parry with because they have the hooking device and you can uh, yank weapons out of people's hands and stuff like that. Swords are great for parrying too. That's what, you know why there's quillions and, and cross guards on there to, for when the blade slides down against your hand, that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you're a really good swordsman, you can, you can work that as well and disarm people. So... Um, and a shield is the very obvious device that's for parrying or blocking. Um, so yeah, parry, parry is usually a term that refers to, uh, as a, a, an actual weapon. Uh, but if you use the term parrying with a shield, it's, it, it's really the same. It's just kind of a fancy, uh, more of a sword play sort of term for just blocking a, an attack. Uh, the word parry is 
So, or Pari. All right. Um, what else can I go into? So, uh, to review really quick. So, dodge defense can be used pretty much whenever against range, range attacks, melee attacks, whatever, as long as you're aware <laughs> and alive. Um, parry defense is, um, uh, you have to have a weapon or shield in your hand. Uh, otherwise you'd have to have, uh, again, without looking up, I think it's maybe four skill levels in brawling, but I think it's seven. Uh, and that allows you to use your brawling defense, um, even if you're unarmed. So otherwise you got to have at least one weapon, even just a dagger. Um, because I've seen people that are, that are good with daggers that can turn an attack on away. Speaking of it and just, and I'll just touch on this really before I go to armor really quick. So um, just to put another more kind of reality and, and realism kind of in fight choreographer kind of thing to this thing. So there's a such thing as a soft parry and a hard parry. And they're called different things, but that's a generic term. Hard parry is uh, when you're literally stopping a weapon. A hard parry, the weapon is stopping. It's probably pushing you back. It's probably loud. It's clanky. It's going to jar your hands depending on how you catch it. But in general, that's a hard parry. A soft parry is turning a weapon kind of to the side just enough. You're almost kind of dodging at the same time. Um, it's more of an elegant kind of finesse kind of move. Uh, or it's a very desperation move. So uh, with a dagger, you're almost always going to use soft parries because especially it gets hit big weapons. Though. So you're just, just knocking away at enough. You might still take a nick here or there, um, but you're keeping it away from your vitals. Uh, bigger weapons, medium two-handed weapons, and heavy weapons in particular, you can do much more hard parries. But in the world, in a fantasy, medieval fantasy, even that may not be true. You might have a you might have a character with a plus three, plus four physique with a big shield and a huge great axe or a warhammer or something, uh, just stopping blows for, for the most part, but then he runs uh, up against a frost giant in single combat or some kind of skirmish. And so now, now even his massive axe, he's having to turn to the side and kind of almost soft parry against the giant's massive club or axe or whatever it is that it is using. So anyway, just a fun little fact there. So, all right, let's go to armor because we're already at 17 minutes. So armor is, uh, the way armor works in Savage Kingdoms, armor, uh, first of all, is armor. It's, uh, it, it refers to body armor as well as shields and your uh, helmet, which is part of, part of body, body armor, honestly, anyway. Um, so on page 274 is where action is combat, but if you go to page 270 or 261, I believe, yeah, 261 is where uh, armor is listed. This is in the equipment or gear and equipment section. Uh, so armor has uh, what's called a protection rating. That's probably its main stat. Uh, for example, soft leather or hide armor, so mostly like just furs or just like soft leather that hasn't been hardened, which is called kirboili, which is, uh, you know, kind of the Roman uh, Latin term for it, uh, that produces hard leather. So that uh, soft leather hide is a uh, protection rating of one, meaning that if you were hit for four points of damage and you're wearing soft leather hide, you subtract one point of damage. That simple. You take three instead of four. Um I know in other videos I've talked about how the damage system works, so I'll just say it again really quick right here. So remember in Savage Kingdoms, um, when you make an attack roll against an opponent, so every point that you succeed your, your opponent's defense, if you succeed, uh, that's a point of base point of damage up to the maximum damage rating of your weapon. For example, if you score 13 above uh, an opponent's defense in an attack roll, which is pretty awesome, um, and you weren't using, wielding a dagger, you wouldn't score 13 points, you would score only 10 points of damage because the dagger's maximum rating is 10. Um, unless it's like uh, Master Crafted, then it, it's up by, by, by one. So, uh, But in, in almost all cases, or if it's uh, in, been enchanted or something like that. Um, so yeah, so every point of damage over, and then you apply some weapons have armor piercing, which is just a, a fancy term for extra damage. For example, a longsword being used in two hands is... Uh, uh, plus one is armor piercing one. So in that example, if you scored four over the opponent's defense, uh, you would score five points of damage with this two-handed longsword theory that I just came up with, uh, minus the one point of armor that we talked about in this case with the soft leather and hide. Uh, hard leather slash padded armor is uh, two points of protection. Brigandine and ring mail, or, or uh, so brigandine. And just to kind of clarify, brigandine armor and Savage Kingdoms is. Um, and, and historians use it 
kind of loosely the way I'm doing it as well. Um, so there's actual brigandine armor. I say actual, but uh, often it's referred to, historians refer to like their, their pockets of plate pieces that are woven into or sewn into a, a gambeson or something like that. There's another term of brigandine, which is an older term, and I think that's the, it's the original term, honestly, was, uh, it comes from the word brigand. So brigands would, because they were just outlaws and thieves, right? They, they didn't have smiths and they lived out in the woods and, you know, think Robin Hood and that kind of thing. They couldn't really afford or make really good armor, so they would piecemeal armor. So a lot of it would be leather-based and they would sew, like, rings or uh, there's the uh, studded leather thing from <laughs> D&D that gets d d gets a bad reputation for because uh, studded leather, as far as we know, didn't really exist because it really kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, but there might be a form of studded leather, uh, be like basically metal uh, rings that are sewn on, uh, metal plates. If you've seen Braveheart, a lot of the Scots, particularly uh, William Wallace, is wearing a form of brigandine armor. So brigandine is really kind of a broad term, meaning uh, metal enhanced leather armor really is kind of a broad term. And that's three points of protection armor. Uh, chain, a chain shirt or chain mail shirt or mail shirt is uh, also three. Uh, a chain hauberk, which is a full, so hauberk is a, is a somewhat, somewhat fancy term of a full suit of chain mail. Uh, suit of, that's not an accurate term. Hauberk is really the term, but if you say suit, that's fine. But this means it goes down to your knees generally in this era. It's not the, doesn't have the, the footies and the mittens in the Savage Kingdoms era, thankfully, because I think that looks silly and in, in, in um, art. But anyway. It's kind of the cool hauberks that the, they were wearing more in the Dark Ages and the early Middle Ages. Um, and then the scale hauberk is worth, the scale hauberk is four protection rating, plate and chain is five. So plate and chain, a reason I didn't, so you could also call it plate mail or plate and mail, which D&D &D does. It's not really a historically accurate term, but most people know what you mean, including some actual, you know, armor historians, the ones that aren't so hung up on every precise word would probably know what you mean uh so basically it's plate mail plate and chain also known as half plate so it's a full suit of chain uh chain hauberk um then there's usually like a, a breastplate or several pieces there's pauldrons and various other pieces of armor plate piece of our bambuses and stuff um that kind of fills it out so it's not full plate armor because we're not quite in that era with the possible exception of next uh, the next thing is dwargar plate armor <laughs> So in the Savage Kingdom's world, the Dwargar, fancy word for the dwarves, they don't really like, most of them don't like being called dwarves. They think it, um, that it's kind of, that's just not, they don't like it. So it's Dwargar, um, but, you know, they, they, so they're fine. Uh, they do farm, make a full suit of player, but it takes a long time. It's really expensive. Only they really know how to do it. There's probably a few humans, maybe even she, uh, uh, Smiths in the world by now that are, up to the game master that might know the secrets, but I, I would be extremely rare. And the Dwargar do not like to share a lot of their crafting secrets with the outside world, even with those they consider allies or friends. They do take a while to kind of make friends anyway, because they live for so long, and they can be a little untrusting. And, you know, sometimes it pays off. So that's an armor rating of six for Dwargar plate armor. Hold on, that's weird. Popped up on the screen. It wants me to reboot. Great. I don't want to do it. Uh, I think it's an update. Silly updates all the time. All right, and then we go to shields. A buckler slash small shield has a protection rating of one. A medium shield has a protection rating of two. Large slash body shield has a protection rating of three. Um, and sometimes we just call it armor rating. It's kind of a short uh, form. You know, most people know what you're talking about. Then we go to helmets. Wearing a war cap with a chain coif. So in other words, a full... Metal probably has a nose guard, doesn't necessarily. Big chain coif at the back um, is um, worth, a, gives you another protection uh, rating bonus, but only when you're wearing it with, and it says there's a note in the book, a uh, little asterisk, uh, only when you're wearing it with actual body armor. So if you're just wearing a helmet and nothing else, uh, your opponents aren't going to swing at your head. There's all this open stuff. So that's what that represents. There's all this open targeting. So it only adds to uh, actual. Armor. And even if it's just soft, it was just one point. Uh, and then, or a war helm slash full helmet also has protection rating of one as well. The difference being that, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, there, there, so, speaking of differences, so each armor type 
Uh, obviously, protection rating is is different amongst most of them, not all of them. Uh, chain chain shirt and uh, brigandine are actually protection rating both protection rating three, and scale hauberk and plate or uh, and chain hauberk are uh, protection rating four. But there are some other differences. So the other statistics for armor is mobility penalty. Um, the only one that has, let's see, uh, Burgundine has a minus one mobility penalty, scale hauberk, and then plate and chain has a minus two, uh, and Dorgar plate armor has a minus three. Oh, and a, a chain, chain mill hauberk is minus four. Meaning that, so if your mobility is 12, it's very simple, and you have a minus one mobility penalty while wearing that type of armor, it's now uh, 11. Pretty simple stuff. So there you go. Um, the next category is skill penalty. So skill penalty is, um, and to clarify, because this comes up a little bit, it's not that confusing, but it's the, it's not every skill in the character sheet, it's the ones that have the asterisks next to it. So if you look at the official character sheet, it'll say asterisk, and it says uh, there's an asterisk, asterisk, and at the bottom of the skill column in the character sheet, it'll say uh, armor penalties apply to these skills. Uh, there's like five or six skills. Well, if you count every all seven magical arts disciplines, I guess there's like 12 skills that are penalized by armor that have an asterisk next to them. That stuff, it's obvious stuff, like acrobatics, stealth, athletics, um, all the magical arts discipline, all, uh, disciplines, all seven of them. Uh, brawling. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, might be all of them. So, like I said, there's like 11 or 12 if you count all uh, uh, magical arts disciplines. So, for example, soft leather, this is, so the lightest form of armor, soft leather slash hide, is, has a skill penalty of minus one. Um, because, you know, it's pretty light, but there has to be some kind of penalty for the armor, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is a, if it's giving you one point of protection, protection, it probably is, it's like wearing some fairly heavy, heavy clothing, so I think that's pretty real, but also in a game design uh, approach, it's, it is kind of a trade-off. Uh, if you put a Sorcerer in leather armor, that's totally doable, but he or she does have minus one to match large rolls, uh, or even like a sneaky type person with stealth. Um, hard leather slash padded is minus two skill penalty. Uh, Brigandine is minus two. Uh, really quick, chainmail shirts minus four. Chainmail hauberks, or no, minus three. Chainmail hauberks minus four. Scale hauberks minus four. Uh, plate and chains minus five. Dwarf plate armor is minus five, also, but Dwarf plate armor is minus three in mobility rating, which I think I already mentioned. And then the cost is anywhere from soft leather armor is ten silver pieces for just average quality, all the way up to six hundred silver, which is sixty gold pieces in a silver-based economy. That's a lot of money uh, for Dwarf plate armor, and that's only if you can find. Uh, someone willing to make it for you or if it's gifted to you by the tour guard or somebody maybe could find on an adventure. And then the next, the last category is other. These are other things. So for example, C means common, U is uncommon, R is rare, and E is exotic. And this applies to all equipment, uh, not just armor. It applies to weapons uh, and other all sorts of armor. So it's a quick way to, to see... Uh, it's, for example, an abbreviation for common. This type of armor uh, can be found in 80% of towns and cities of some note uh, or size. Um, and then all the way down to exotic, which is uh, there's only a 10% chance that that item exists in a uh, even in a halfway decent sized town or city. Uh, if you go to like a massive metropolis that's a big trade mecca, then you know, the GM is free to increase that. I, I definitely do. Uh, possibly up to 50 percent or 40 percent for even exotic and then rare and uncommon kind of come in right in between uh those two so like all items uh certain types of armor can be common and uncommon so the rarest type of armor as you might imagine is Dorgar plate armor uh and there's only two with r's which is rare and that's plate and chain and scale hauberk so everything else is either uncommon or common types of armor uh, all right, so bulk is also a way, uh, bulk is how you track, I guess I'll do a video on that at some point, but bulk is like how much weight you're carrying, how much encumbrance. Uh, so in Savage Games, instead of tracking every like pound or stone, or however fancy term you want to use for a pound, um, we use what's called bulk. And so bulk is generally 8 to 15 pounds. The reason it's generally because I used the example before, a, like a sad big sack of feathers Probably only weighs like maybe eight pounds, but it's definitely going to be bulk one, maybe two, even bulk two. Um, and then some things are true weight. You're carrying this massive bowling ball size stone around. That's at least bulk one, maybe bulk two, but 
Yeah, it's probably going to weigh 25 pounds. So, um, yeah, so it's just kind of a quick way to measure things. So, uh, the only the only armor that has bulk is bulk one for brigandine slash ringmail, bulk one for chainmail hauberk, uh, bulk two for scale hauberk. Um, a bit, a bit, right? Yeah. Bulk two for uh, plate and chain, and bulk three, a bulk rating of three for Drogar plate armor. Uh, also, a large uh, large shield is bulk one. Um, right. Uh, okay. Also, in the other category, there it lists a few things like you have to have a, a minimum of a certain attribute to to wield the weapon properly uh, or wear it. Um, pff, weapon. I'm, I'm talking about armor. Scale armor. Uh, scale armor. You need at least a physique of minus one. Uh, chain metal harbor, you need a physique of at least minus two, and a chain shirt, you need at least a physique of minus three, which pretty much most people have, um, if not all characters that I've seen. Uh, Brigandine, a physique of minus two at least. Um, yeah, even shields, you have to have a minus three to a minus one, depending if it's a buckler or a, a large shield. So if you don't have that, it's kind of like with weapons, so it doesn't mean you just can't wear it, you're just sitting there, uh, but it means you get more further penalties. So uh, I forgot what the penalty is for this. <laughs> I think it doubles the. Uh, oh no, you add the, you add the skill penalty to every skill if you're wearing armor that you're not. You don't really have the physique for. So there you go, because it's bulky as as crap. Um, all right, and there's a few other things. Oh, prestige. Prestige is a thing with certain weapons, uh, like particularly swords. Um, that if you're carrying the West, same with armor. So if you're carrying it or wearing that item, you get a plus one to your renown. Uh, so the only prestige armor is Dwargar plate armor, as you might imagine. Um, not even plate and chain, unless it's exceptional quality. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. So and speaking of which, uh, prestige weapons and armor only applies if the if it's at least of exceptional quality or better. So there you go. Uh, what else can I? I think it's a Pretty close to being it. We're at like 32 minutes exactly. What else can I mention for armor? Hmm. Um, master crafted. Yeah, I guess I can go over that really quick. So, uh, so the armor cost in the book and the scarcity, you know, whether it's uncommon or common, uh, rare, and that kind of stuff, that's all assumed to be average quality armor. Um, if you get, if you find some poor quality armor, like something maybe a goblin's wearing or just some beat up old crap that's on a, that's been in a tomb for 200 years, poor quality armor suffers one additional skill penalty and minus one protection rating if chain, shirt, or greater for the last part. Costs 6% of normal value, so that's a good, really good thing. You save 40%. Protection rating is brought to zero. Uh, so when its protection rating is brought to zero, it means it's destroyed. Uh, Poor armor is, in other words, there are uh, like trolls, there are di different things in the game that can reduce uh, protection ratings. Poor armor is, is either terribly crafted or re represents a previously damaged item. So yeah, so poor, it's either really, it was really never well made or it's just be all beat up and just kind of barely hanging on. Average quality is just kind of is the base. Um, exceptional quality armor suffers one less skill penalty and costs two times normal price. Exceptional quality armor is uncommon uh, as such as uh, as such is generally produced by only skilled armorsmiths. There you go. So, um, and it's a little more durable. I didn't put that in there, but I guess it's kind of obvious. Master crafted armor suffers one less skill penalty and one less mobility penalty. Costs five times normal price and only found in, in selective locations. Master crafted armor increases the rarity or frequency by one level or one degree. That is, chain hauberks are uh, uncommon scarcity. Uh, instead of uh, a rare, instead of uncommon, this type of armor is capable of holding a permanent enchantment. Is generally made only by master smiths. There you go. All right, and then we get to uh, master so heroic quality armor. That's the next level. That's really rare. It, it's usually either enchanted or it's just so well made. Uh, even without an enchantment, it's just amazing. But basically, it means it. It's usually it means it's enchanted. Uh, heroic quality armor suffers two less skill penalty, one less mobility penalty, and gains a plus one protection rating. So to gain a bonus uh, to your armor rating, you have to has to be at least heroic quality. It costs fifteen times normal cost, normal being the average quality cost, though essentially priceless and seldom for sale. Heroic quality armor and shields and helmets are either mastercrafted items of great enchantment or armors worn or utilized by highly renowned heroes of old. 
Uh, the scarcity rating of heroic quality armor increases by two degrees. For example, an average quality large shield rate of zero means it's exotic instead. Blah, blah blah. All right, and then there's legendary, legendary, which is almost unheard of. I mean, hence why it's called legendary. Legendary uh, suffers two less skill penalty, two less mobility penalty, and gains a plus two protection rating. So if you can get a hold of some of that, that's awesome. These items are priceless and never for sale in the open market, if at all. Legendary armor item, uh, armor items always have a magical characteristic or two, whether it is to provide protection from fire to the wearer, plus to the wearer's luck, or a host of other possibilities up to the uh, game master, which when it's always fun to kind of craft treasure and you know magic items and kind of stuff. All right, and then we go into other armor compositions, like when armor is made out of bone or made out of bronze or made out of silderil, which is star metal. It's just the, the she term or the elven term for it or whether it's made out of wood, whether it's made, uh, sleeping in armor. Uh, but I think we're going to end here. Actually, I'll, I'll end with sleeping armor. I don't, uh, I'm not going to go into the different armor compositions, but it is covered in the book. And um, uh, right, so sleeping in armor. Sleeping armor without looking, though I am apparently, if I recall. So, yeah, you uh, in the morning, so after a full night's sleep, when you wake up and ready to travel, uh, and you would have all your stamina back, theoretically, if you slept, all through the, you know, long enough, or you didn't use it during the day or whatever, um, you would wake up in the morning with uh, a stamina penalty equal to the armor, uh, uh, the skill penalty of the armor. So if you slept all night in hard leather armor, you would wake up being down two stamina points. So very simple. That's how it works. If you were sleeping in, say, plate and chain, right, you would be down four. Yeah, four stamina. So is it horrible? Um, I've actually slept in chain mail before in real life overnight at some medieval reenactment. It might have been a LARP, but I think it was actually a medieval reenactment event. Um, staying kind of up on watch. It was really fun. Right? Like stay, actually staying up on watch around the campfire. It was really cool. Um, but it was a little annoying. It wasn't terrible, but it was. Uh, I was so tired, though, that night from running around and doing stuff uh, that I just kind of basically fell asleep with the armor um, and on. So... And when I woke up, I was kind of, I was a little stiff and, you know, like my shoulders were, uh, because wearing chain balls carries a lot on your shoulders unless you know how to belt it correctly. But even if you double belt it like you're supposed to, uh, it, it still kind of gets, especially if you're just sitting there sleeping against a tree for six hours like an idiot. Um, so yeah, it, in other words, it was doable, but I, I, you know, I think that's pretty fair. I felt like I was down maybe two stamina points, at least for the first hour or two of the morning, so. There you go. I think that's going to about do it. I've got a cat rubbing against me, and uh, even though they've already been fed, my wife is on this way, her way home. And um, yeah, that's going to be it. This video went a little bit longer than I want, but they usually do. So hopefully that was helpful to you guys and gals. And thanks for hanging with me, and hopefully you're enjoying the videos. Please like, subscribe, and share, and all that good stuff, and I will talk to you all again soon. Bye. Bye.